Hello, a warm welcome to everyone joining live today and those joining on demand. I'm Peter Andrews. I'm the Director of Consumer Rights Innovation and Impact at Consumers International. This session is to explore the revision of the G20 OECD high level principles on financial consumer protection and importantly, give all of you listening the opportunity to comment and ask questions. Firstly, please use the chat function to introduce who you are, from which organisation and where in the world you are joining from. You may also use the chat function to add comments and also Q&A uh, chat box for any questions and we'll have plenty of time for questions from the audience uh, shortly. So this session is part of a week of impact orientated events uh, from our Fair Digital Finance Forum to amplify our celebrations of World Consumer Rights Day taking place every year on March the 15th. We've already had some incredible conversations over the last few days, bringing together voices from civil society, businesses and government. Today, we have a short 45 minute fireside chat with our friends at the OECD, exploring the pro proposed revisions to those high level principles on financial consumer protection. But let me provide some context. So the G20 OECD high level principles on financial consumer protection are, as the title suggests, common principles on consumer protection in the field of financial services. They are being revised for the first time in a decade. So this is a great opportunity to input. In that decade, uh, financial services have evolved to the rapid spread of new technologies across the world. In the developing world, for example, the proportion of account owners sending and receiving digital payments has grown from 57% in 2014 to 70% in 2017, so just in three years. The use of digital services has continued to rise dramatically worldwide, and this has been accelerated during the pandemic, as many of you will have appreciated. Now, we believe digital finance brings new and exciting opportunities for consumers, but also new risks that can lead to unfair outcomes for consumers. CGAP recently highlighted 60 plus new consumer risks in yesterday's session in the Fair Digital Finance Forum. And this is why it's timely that the OECD are reviewing the principles to address these new challenges and ensure we can harness the fantastic opportunity financial services and digital finance presents to consumers. The consumer voice, as you will appreciate, is critical to ensure robust consumer protection frameworks. We have seen over the course of the Fair Digital Finance Forum how our members have successfully used interventions and tools to protect consumers of financial services and influence decision makers at the national level. It's critical this voice continues to be brought to the global level too. And that is why Consumers International has been pleased to engage in the consultation on the revisions and thanks the OECD for the opportunity. Our vision for fair digital finance has shaped our approach to this consultation. And that vision is whereby digital finance is inclusive, it's safe, it's data protected and private, and it's sustainable. And we have worked closely with our members to develop our response to that consultation. Today's session will take a step back and explore what these proposed, proposed revisions are and how they will be incorporated into the principles. We welcome your perspectives on how the proposed revisions can capture critical elements from consumer protection. But first, let me hand to Anna Dawson. Anna is the Financial Consumer Protection Specialist at the OECD, where she supports the G20 OECD Task Force on Financial Consumer Protection and the International Finance Consumer Protection Organization. Anna leads the 10 yearly strategic review of the G20 OECD High Level Principles on Financial Consumer Protection. So as we listen to Anna, please do post any questions you have into the Q&A box. But first of all, Anna, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you very much for the invitation to join the forum. Um, it's an extremely important opportunity for me to be able to engage with you all as the task force undertakes um, this very important and strategic review of the G20 OECD high level principles on financial consumer protection. And as you've already mentioned, Peter, the consumer voice is critical to the review and we thank Consumers International and their members for their support and input to shape the review more broadly, including um, the recent submissions to the current consultation process on the draft revisions. Um, so just moving to the next slide, please. Um, so just very briefly to recap um, and frame the discussion today, um, this slide sets out the 10 existing 
um, principles. So these are the key concepts that provide an effective and comprehensive framework for establishing um, a financial consumer protection regime in jurisdictions. And this ranges from the legal and regulatory settings or oversight bodies, um, all the way through to effective um, transparency um, requirements and data protection, as well as redress mechanisms. So the principles are designed as a high level set of principles to um, provide guidance to policymakers and to providers. Um, they're intended to apply to any jurisdiction and they're also cross-sexual in nature, which is an important point, which means that they can be, they can be applied to credit, banking, payments, insurance, pensions and investment sectors. And the principles that you can see on the slide here are supplemented by practical guidance in the form of effective approaches, setting out how countries can implement the principles. Um, so just to briefly highlight what the review of these principles set out to do, it had three objectives. The first one being to assess implementation by jurisdictions. Um, second, to evaluate the continued importance and relevance of the principles. And third, to identify developments that require updates to the principles to ensure that they continue to reflect best practices and that they're forward looking. Um, so we had very positive and widespread engagement in the review. Um, we had 35 OECD member jurisdictions participating, all G20 and FSB countries, as well as 10 other countries, um, which included um, some more developing countries. So it was 55 jurisdictions in total um, participated in the implementation review. And we also sought views from consumer stakeholders as well as business stakeholders. So the implementation report was published in January this year, and we've recently consulted on proposed revisions to the actual principles, which we'll go through in the presentation today. Um, so just moving to the next slide, please. Um, so to frame our discussion, we'll touch on what some of the key findings and conclusions of the implementation report were at a very high level. Um, so the first um, finding with, in relation to implementation um, was positive um, and it was that the majority of jurisdictions have implemented the principles with most of the remaining principles being partially implemented. So in this way, we found that the principles have been instrumental in setting the standard for and guiding the establishment of consumer protection frameworks around the world. So in addition to seeking um, the self-assessment by jurisdictions about the implementation of the principles, we also gathered broader views and stakeholder perspectives about their um, views on implementation. Um, so we asked consumer and business stakeholders um, whether they thought um, the overall implementation of the principles had been fully or partially implemented in their jurisdiction. Um, and this indicated that there is more work to be done on juris on, by jurisdictions in relation to implementation um, and also led to a finding about um, that there might be ways to improve the dissemination of the principles, um, particularly around communication. So for instance, there might be a need for better communication to raise the visibility of the implementation of the principles um, or the outcomes for consumers from the consumer protection frameworks that are in place might need to be made more visible. Um, this finding also supports the need for more effective and visible consultation or liaison to ensure that the views of consumer representatives, which is a key aspect already in the existing principle one, um, but may need to be enhanced um, in implementation. Um, so and that's to ensure that the views of consumer representatives are engaged um, in the development of legislation and regulation in order um, for jurisdictions to formulate consumer centred policy. Next slide, please. Um, so it's a very simple slide, but shows an important point. Um, and that is that the principles were found to remain important and relevant um, to all jurisdictions and stakeholders. So both by jurisdictions, consumer and business groups, um, and that they provide a very solid foundation on which to build any revisions on. Um, so this means that what the task force is doing at the moment is building on the existing set of 10 principles, not starting again. Um, and the review found that there was consensus across many of the points. Next slide, please. So the final finding that I will touch on today is that the review found that the principles continue to reflect best practices globally and are forward looking, but there are revisions to be made to ensure that it keeps up with the changes that have happened over the past 10 years and new developments. So as you can see on the slide, there are a number of trends, policy developments or approaches that have evolved since the principles were first developed 10 years ago. Plus there are also lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic um, that form the basis of the proposed revisions for the principles, um, which have just recently been consulted on. 
So consideration of all these policy developments have been supported by participants in the review, as well as being supported by the latest research in academic literature and other um, seminars and um, international dialogues. So in particular, looking um, to what consumer groups have expressed strong support for, um, they've expressed strong support for many of these areas, and in particular, digitalization, um, the fair treatment of vulnerable consumers, um, the importance of enhancing access and inclusion and quality financial products being offered to consumers. Um, and through the recent consultation process, consumer groups have also um, expressed further views um, around what's important from their perspective, um, and that's being um, considered very carefully. So I'll just elaborate um, in the next slide on a couple of these areas. Um, so unsurprising um, to all of you, I'm sure, is one of the first areas digitalization where there's been significant impacts, opportunities and risks of digitalization and technological advances on financial consumers. And this has been particularly prevalent given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the increasing shift to digital delivery. Digitalization is transforming the way that consumers interact with financial products, as well as they interact with providers. Um, and it's also presenting new opportunities, which might mean faster, cheaper, more secure transactions and convenient service delivery for many consumers. But on the other hand, digitalization has also brought many new or increasing risks, which include online fraud and scams, data breaches, or discriminatory outcomes arising from algorithmic decision-making, which may result in financial exclusion or a lack of recourse for consumers. The Revisions to the principles seek to incorporate these opportunities and challenges from digitalization, and it features very heavily in the proposed revisions. And it was found that digitalization um, throughout the review was relevant to all of the principles. So relatedly, um, some of the key lessons from COVID-19 also feature digitalization. So as I just mentioned, so scams and frauds increased in many jurisdictions, and they often occurred through digital channels. It was found that increased protections were required along with financial education to mitigate scams and frauds. And importantly, the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic also highlighted the importance of flexible and responsive financial consumer protection arrangements, particularly in relation to supporting consumers who may be experiencing vulnerability, for instance, those suffering from financial hardship. And this has required some jurisdictions to examine what does consumer vulnerability mean from a regulatory perspective and for them to consider adapting their approach. Um, and there's been some positive movement towards a more nuanced approach in relation to um, consumers experiencing vulnerability, um, which has also been covered at a previous session um, in the forum yesterday. Um, another key theme arising um, from the pandemic was the um, implications of the pandemic on the financial, financial wellbeing and resilience of consumers. And the effective financial consumer protection contributes to enhanced financial well-being. So in that way, financial well-being can be considered as an important goal um, of policies aimed at greater consumer empowerment, including financial inclusion, financial literacy, and financial consumer protection policies. Next slide, please. Um, so looking at another couple of key areas, um, access and inclusion was a key area um, where the review found that the access to and inclusion of um, consumers to financial products and services should be key objectives of governments, oversight bodies and financial service providers. This includes both addressing the barriers that prevent consumers from accessing the formal regulated financial system, as well as ensuring that consumers remain included in the financial system for example, in the event of financial hardship, which has been very prevalent with COVID-19. So um, this topic covers issues for both developing and more developed jurisdictions. And it's a really important opportunity for the review to incorporate in the principles lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic where the issue has been very prominent. Um, so in relation to quality financial products, there's been an increasing trend across jurisdictions for a greater focus on the quality of financial products that are offered to consumers. And currently there's no principle um, that focuses on the quality of the actual financial products themselves. Uh, in particular, the broader concept that there should be appropriate 
financial product oversight and governance to ensure that products are designed and distributed to meet the needs and objectives of the target consumers. So this might mean, for instance, that firms should have appropriate systems in place to design, approve and manage financial products throughout their life cycle to ensure that they meet the interests and objectives of consumers that they're designed for, as well as the regulatory requirements. It might also mean that in order to promote financial um, products, oversight bodies um, could also require firms to design a target market for a financial product, conduct research, use behavioural insights to understand that target market, and depending on the type and complexity and risk of the product, they might need to carry out testing before launching the product. Um, the impacts of sustainable finance has also been a key theme that's come up in the review, um, but in the interest of time, um, we'll just move to the next slide now, please. Uh, so this slide summarises the proposed draft revisions to the principles that the task force has just consulted on. And I thank Consumers International again and its members for its submissions to this consultation process. Um, it was, we received um, over 50 submissions. It was a very active um, and engaged um, consultation process. So um, at the moment, we're at the point of carefully considering all of the feedback that was raised for that process. Um, so just to summarise um, briefly and at a, quite a high level, um, the proposed revisions um, are public in the consultation document, but I'll just cover off what some of the, I guess, main revisions or types of um, categories um, of revisions are. So the first one is um, the addition of two new principles relating to access and inclusion and quality financial products, which we just touched on on the previous slide. Um, so these areas are not explicitly covered um, by the current principles. And the task force view is that they're required in order to ensure a holistic and comprehensive approach to financial consumer protection. Um, so in relation to accessing and inclusion, supporting consumers access to and use of financial products and services um, in, requires both addressing the barriers that prevent them from accessing the system, as well as ensuring that they remain in the system when there are instances of vulnerability or financial hardship. Um, and relatedly, quality financial products. Um, this, this leads to products being on the market that meet the interests of target consumers. And it's an important addition um, in part to acknowledge the limits of disclosure on conduct requirements by themselves um, and could be considered an appropriate uh, precursor to the principle and responsible business conduct um, of providers, which is also why we've restructured the order of the principles as well, so that um, the conduct and culture requirements come after the design of quality financial products. And this new principle eight also complements um, the new principle three on access and inclusion, as once consumers enter the financial system, we think that they should have access to quality financial products that meet their needs and contribute to their financial wellbeing. So the second um, category or type of proposed revision to the principle is the addition of three cross-cutting themes, which you can see um, graphically circling um, the 12 principles. So the rationale and thinking behind proposing these three themes that cut across all of the principles is that they're relevant to the consideration and implementation of all the principles. Um, not just one or two of the principles, and particularly in relation to digitalization and financial wellbeing, that came through strongly in the review process. So the proposed three um, principles are digitalization, financial wellbeing, and sustainable finance. They're set out as themes, and then rather than duplicating them throughout all of the principles, um, a few of the key examples have been picked up and included throughout the principles to illustrate um, where those themes are relevant. Um, to be incorporated in the principles when jurisdictions um, are implementing them. Um, so on digitalization in particular, it's um, more advanced um, than sustainable finance or more developed, particularly in, in terms of the impacts on retail consumers. So there's a number of digitalization um, examples throughout the principles and some of the feedback we've received so far is that um, uh, there would be support for more examples being included as well um, around crypto and a few other areas as well. Um, and just touching very briefly on sustainable finance. Um, so this is about considering the impact opportunities and risks of sustainable finance on financial consumers. And it's an increasingly important area for financial consumers as the demand for and availability of green products grows. 
Um, and it's also important that there's transparency in order to mitigate risks such as greenwashing, um, which is where a product is passed off as being more environmentally friendly than, than it actually is um, and can influence the um, decision investment decisions that consumers make. So um, this has also been a very strongly supportive theme throughout the consultation process, but on sustainable finance, um, it's probably more of an emerging theme in relating to um, retail consumers than the other two themes. So just finally, I'm um, touching on the third type of um, revision um, proposed in the principles. This is to incorporate the important lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic um, in terms of financial consumers. Um, so the way that this has been done is through including explicit references um, throughout the principles. Um, for instance, um, in relation to the principle um, on the fair treatment of consumers, explicitly mentioning um, that it refers to consumers experiencing vulnerability and also making more prominent um, the importance of protecting consumers from financial scams. Um, so just moving to the final slide, please, um, just to finish off the presentation today before we move into the discussion, um, just to recap very briefly on the next steps for the review. So we've um, had a lot of active um, feedback provided to us, which is really encouraging. Um, stakeholders are very engaged in the review. Um, the Secretariat at the moment is working through and considering all of that feedback very carefully. Um, that will then be um, taken to the task force later this month to seek their views on proposed changes um, to the principles. Um, once the task force is happy um, with the revised set of principles will then be seeking the approval of the G20 and of the OECD um, to adopt the new principles. Um, and that will be a very important milestone. And then looking beyond that um, is a lot of important work to be done relating to dissemination um, and developing the updated implementation guidance um, that will support jurisdictions um, in relation to implementing the new principles. Um, and I'll hand back to you now, Peter, thank you. Great, thank you so much for that, Anna. Um, really encouraging to see all of the changes that are being made, and we're delighted that we've been able to contribute to this important review. So we've, uh, in our response, voiced our support for the cross-cutting principles of financial well-being, digitalization, technology, technological advancements, and sustainable finance. And we also agree that access and inclusion and quality financial products should be included in these new principles. But whilst there's more to be done across all of the principles to ensure consumers are protected and empowered, at a top level, we'd like to see more jurisdictions focusing on consumer empowerment and incorporating the consumer voice in the implementation of the principles. However, I would love to hear the perspectives of the audience. I've seen lots of great questions coming in, and it's amazing to see so many people from across the world joining this session today. So I've seen uh, people from Malaysia, Portugal, Peru, Republic of Korea, uh, Brazil and Kenya all joining this session today. So thank you all very much. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions that have come through to the Q&A box. Um, uh, please, uh, for the rest of you in the audience, please do keep putting questions through. Uh, the first one comes from Els from uh, Euroconsumer. Els, are you able to come off mute and perhaps ask your question uh, directly to Anna? Uh, hi, hello, good morning. Uh, hopefully you can all uh, hear me. Um, first of all, congratulations with the, with the, with the updated principles. Uh, they seem to be, uh, be very timely and, and indeed reflecting the priorities and uh, the highlights, the needs of, of 2022. Um, we were particularly happy to see that in the approach, uh, in the preparation of the principles, the approach, uh, the, the, the areas to be taken into account, reference was being made to, to innovation. Um, as a consumer organization, of course, we want consumers to be protected, be safe and have quality products. But as a consumer organization, it's equally our aim to you know, deliver innovation to consumers, uh, consumer proof innovation that uh, facilitates their life. Um, for us, consumer protection and innovation, they go hand in hand. However, having a look at the 12 principles itself, uh, I didn't see innovation as such reflected, or although not very explicitly. So my question was a little bit, um, how do you see the balance between consumer protection and innovation within these principles? Uh, will they leave enough room for, for cutting edge uh, innovation and uh, maybe a, a more general consideration? 
uh, has it been considered to add innovation as a fourth uh, cross-cutting team uh, next to sustainability and digitalization and, and well-being? Or would this be an idea to make it a bit more explicit like that? Are you fine for me to jump in, Peter? And yes, of course, please do. Thanks very much, Elsie, for your question. I think it's a really great question and um, it touches on some other feedback that we've received throughout the review process as well. Um, so first of all, to, stay, to say that I completely agree with you, innovation is extremely important. Um, it is covered in the existing principles, um, but I do agree with you that it's not particularly explicit. So it's currently included in the principle at the moment that talks about competition um, and the promotion of competitive markets um, and states that it, these markets need to enable innovation and drive good outcomes for consumers. Um, and as you mentioned, there's of course a balance between um, innovation um, and consumer protection regulations um, and, and how that plays out in practice. Um, so I guess I, my starting point would be the current principles um, certainly um, do not preclude innovation occurring at all. And I think that it's probably more the other way. They think um, that innovation is incredibly important. And we've seen that occurring a lot in um, jurisdictions as they've implemented the principles. Um, there has been some feedback that innovation could be a bit more prominent and that's something that we're considering. Um, I think one example um, that you point out in relation to innovation, I think probably a lot of examples relating to innovation are captured under the digitalization theme. Um, so one good example is in relation to the proposed principle on access and inclusion. So um, it talks about leveraging digitalization to play an important role in developing products for underserved consumers to meet their needs, make it easier for them to be included. And I think that's one place in particular where innovation can play a really important role um, so that companies can develop um, these new products um, and services that meet the needs of perhaps um, the not so traditional consumers or consumers who have different needs compared to mainstream consumers. Um, so I think that's one important area where innovation certainly is very important. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this needs to be balanced with appropriate protections um, and rules to ensure um, that consumers are safe in dealing um, with these new sorts of products and services. And a lot of jurisdictions have implemented regulatory sandboxes, innovation hubs and similar initiatives to facilitate the innovation of new financial products or services while also delivering an appropriate level of financial consumer protection. Um, the review found that there's actually around 70% of the jurisdictions that participated that have um, brought in place these regimes under the existing set of principles. So, um, I think probably in summary, the existing principles support and encourage innovation. Um, and we certainly intend the revised principles to do that as well, balanced by the appropriate protections. Um, so we can certainly look at um, whether the task force can make that a little bit more prominent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Anna. OK, so uh, we've got a, a great question just come in from Yuk Young from uh, our member Consumers Career. Uh, Yuk Young, are you able to come off mute and ask your question directly, or would you like me to read it out? Um, I, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, good. So um, thank you for all your great work, um, both at the OECD and on Consumers International. So um, my question was about um, the implementation of the principles in the future. So I noted that the in the um, implementation report, um, a lot of the... Um, countries, the OECD countries actually had a very, very high rate of implementation, but, but um, coming from a consumer advocacy's um, perspective, we find things are lacking um, on the ground. For, for, um, for more, most of the developed countries, we do, we do have the laws and regulations in places, but of course, it's always the um, enforcement of the laws and how they, the laws are actually um, played out that is important. So in that regard, I was wondering um, if the OECD could consider developing um, some more quantitative indicators or yardstick measurements where the consumer organizations could um, take part in, in the um, assessment process for the implementation um, of the principles. So in that way, I believe the, the principles would be more relevant for for the nations and for the 
the other stakeholders, especially the consumer um, advocates in the future. Thank you, Yuking. And th this is a critical point and one we make in our submission, actually. And uh, I think we had an example from IDEC as well in Brazil, uh, highlighting that the country, uh, the Brazil has fully in implemented uh, some of the, the principles, and yet they're not seeing uh, this happening really on the ground and the impact uh, on consumers. So, Anna, are you able to answer that question? Oh, I'm happy to share my thoughts. Um, so I guess to frame, frame my response, um, first of all, I'd just like to touch on the methodology for the review. Um, so the methodology um, was comprehensive. It um, because due to resourcing, as I'm sure is um, uh, a common issue um, with all of you as well. Ideally, we'd like to go out and self-assess all jurisdictions ourselves, but that's not possible. So what we developed was a comprehensive questionnaire, which set it out for um, each of the principles, um, a set of criteria to help them self-assess whether or not they've implemented the principles in their jurisdiction or whether there are areas where they might have more work to do. Um, so this was part of the evaluation process, and that's, um, I guess, an ongoing tool that jurisdictions can use to track their um, progress as well. And part of the work of the task force is ongoing work in relation to um, how effective has implementation been. Um, so tools like that are incredibly helpful um, to, for jurisdictions to consider where they might need to do a little bit more work. Um, and I think probably what this also touches on is um, the importance of the consumer voice um, and bringing another perspective um, to the policy de debate. And I think that this is where um, it provides a lot of opportunities for consumer bodies to engage um, with policymakers in their jurisdictions um, to, to seek more clarification about how the principles have been um, implemented. And there'll also be a further opportunity once the um, revisions have been made to the principles, there'll also be a further, I guess, opportunity or platform um, for effective advocacy as well. So um, I think it, it's all moving in a really positive um, direction and there'll be um, a lot of opportunities going forward as well, um, where the, I guess, effectiveness of the implementation um, can be looked at. Thank you, Anna. Um, okay, so we've got a, another question that's come through from Vinay uh, in Portugal. Uh, Vinay, are you able to come off mute and ask your question? Hi, uh, morning. Um, thank you for uh, this event, which is very uh, timely and important. Uh, and thank you for the work done by the OECD. It's very welcome. Um, from our side, from the consumer protection perspective, um, we're happy to see many of the changes that actually meet uh, our, our aims and our objectives. Um, also, um, we, we do consider that digitalization and financial well-being are definitely fundamental. Um, we are happy to see them included as cross-cutting um, uh, objectives. Um, going to a bit of a detail, um, we see access to cash as crucial. Um, we wouldn't see it as, a, as a, only if uh, it's not universally accepted to have digital payments. We would see it the other way around. Uh, access should be uh, always present, access to cash and payments with cash, uh, and then uh, digital means as a, a, a second option uh, whenever they, they are available. And recently we had we had issues with uh, with the hacking uh, of uh, Vodafone network, for example, in Portugal, which led to issues with payments using, using mobile payments uh, from Vodafone clients. Uh, we also had a crash on the, the payment networks in Portugal uh, by SIBs and also a hack of the, the main bank in Portugal. So these situations showed that access to cash and payments with cash are fundamental. Another issue which is very timely is access to, um, to the financial system for refugees and migrants. Uh, and currently we are seeing that across Europe uh, with uh, um, refugees from this very sad situation in Ukraine. Um, so we see that there's an issue of implementing uh, the payment accounts directive uh, um, uh, access to basic accounts uh, um, for those who eventually may not have uh, um, IDs uh, which are accepted. But my question um, is about sustainable finance. Uh, although we do understand it's timely, um, I was just wondering how does the OECD see its implementation uh, under the current scenario of ongoing development of regulation, for example, this taxonomy, which is a bit uh, ongoing and not totally defined yet. So how do you how do you plan to have uh, such principles and such 
um, inclusion in uh, uh, working development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, um, we also do emphasize the importance of cash and access and inclusion principles. So I think that's a really good point to make. Um, Anna, any, any thoughts? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question, Vinay. Um, I completely agree with your first comment about cash and, um, I guess, uh, access through traditional channels, whether that's bank branches. Um, there are certain segments of the population where that will remain important. Um, and I think that um, in no way are we suggesting that um, digital should completely supplant um, cash or bank branches for example. Um, so that's something that we're very conscious of as well. And uh, as we talk about digitalization, it's great because it does include a lot of consumers, but we've also got to be very mindful about the consumers that might actually be being excluded from it. So I think it's a really relevant comment that you've made. Um, in relation to sustainable finance, um, I think that's a great question that you've asked. Um, I completely agree with you that sustainable finance, particularly in the retail consumer protection um, space, but also more from the investment space, is a bit of a nebulous concept. Um, it's not, there are not really clear definitions of exactly what it means. Um, but what is clear is that it's an important area that is growing, that it will have impacts on financial consumers. And because we have the opportunity now at the 10 year mark to reframe the principles, we think going forward over say the next 10 years, it will only grow in increasing importance. Um, so for instance, what we've put in the proposed revisions to the principles at the moment um, is quite a wide definition and some feedback has been that um, stakeholders would like it to be more defined, but I think probably um, the essence of what it is um, it probably warrants a more, more fulsome and open um, definition at this point. So at the moment, the principles proposed to include the impact opportunities and risks of sustainable finance for financial consumers. Um, and we suggested that this includes, but is not limited to considering um, that financial consumer, um, sorry, financial service providers are increasingly incorporating um, ESG or an environmental, social and governance factors into their operations, products and services. And that there's also growing consumer demand for these sorts of products. And we've also seen, um, particularly um, in the European context, um, an in increasing demand for more financial educational literacy around sustainable finance policies. Um, so as financial consumer protection policies uh, shift towards a fairer, greener, more inclusive economy, um, it needs to be able to facilitate the development of sustainable business models. So um, what we've done at the moment in the principles is in including it as a theme, we've included two specific examples in the principles, um, which are quite high level. Um, so the first one is in principle two in relation to the role of oversight bodies. Um, so the proposed language is that oversight bodies should have um, the capability, flexibility and appropriate range of tools and powers. And this might mean adapting market monitoring, for instance, relating to sustainable finance development. So that leaves, I think the intent is to have quite a wide application so that jurisdictions um, can implement um, what's appropriate um, to them. The other specific example that we've called out in the principles in, in relation to the principle on disclosure and transparency, um, which is the most obvious risk to financial consumers at the moment from sustainable finance. Um, and that's around including transparency, for example, as sustainable finance, um, including ESG, becomes increasingly important to consumers and to providers. Transparency also becomes even more important to help consumers to understand their investments and to counter the risks of greenwashing. Thank you, Anna. And I think yeah, no, it's, a, it's a really important point. And um, uh, sustainable finance is part of our vision for fair digital finance. And actually, the, the day tomorrow is dedicated to, to this topic area. So I encourage everyone in the audience to, to tune into the various sessions that we've got on, on that. And hopefully that answers uh, uh, your question as well, Jose, I've seen in the, in the Q&A. Um, we are running close to time, so I think there is one more opportunity for a question and then um, I've got one as well. But uh, Gerard uh, Brody, um, I think uh, from Australia, uh, do you want to ask your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes, hi. Um, great presentation. Thanks so much for, for the session. Um, my question really goes to the principles around responsible business conduct. In Australia, we've had a Banking Royal Commission, um, which identified a lot of misconduct in, in the banking and finance sector, and that, that fact that it was driven by uh, practices such as conflicted remuneration, the role of, of salespeople and intermediaries that really were focused on, the, the as the Royal Commission called it, greed rather than customer need, um, and also uh, marketing, the upsell, the cross-sell, and unsolicited selling. So uh, my question is, um, I couldn't really see how these sort of principles were um, incorporated into the rev revisions. Obviously, there is the principle there about resp responsible business conduct, but would it be additionally helpful to articulate more of those sort of lessons from, from the Australian Banking Royal Commission? Did you want me to jump straight in, Peter? Yeah, if that's okay, Anna. Sure. Um, thank you so much for your question, Jared. It's a really good question. Um, so the high-level principles are by design not sector-specific, so they don't go specifically into credit. Um, but the broad concepts, um, such as responsible business conduct or quality financial products, can be applied by jurisdictions to specific sectors as appropriate. Um, and a, a really good example um, is the OECD recommendation um, on consumer protection in the field of consumer credit. Um, so it covers responsible lending, unfair credit terms, fees and charges. Um, and it's essentially a, a sector specific application um, of the principles to consumer credit. So um, perhaps that helps with a bit of a missing piece of the puzzle. So um, the task force, um, so they, this instrument was adopted in 2019 and it will be, um, revised, generally OECD instruments are revised every five years. So it will be coming up for review in a couple of um, years time. Um, and for this, this recommendation, the principles, um, the, so the high level principles really set the overarching framework um, and it's actually structured around the existing 10 um, principles. And then it goes into a, a credit specific application for each of the 10 principles um, and draws out, particularly in relation to, as you mentioned, responsible business conduct, draws out the elements that are relevant there in particular um, to consumer credit. Um, so I think that, that perhaps might be helpful to fill in that gap. Does that help, Jared? Is that? Yeah, no, thank you. That's helpful. Um, I wasn't aware of that additional piece. I mean, the, the same issues arise in other areas uh, like superannuation, like insurance, um, like even bank accounts, um, where there was, you know, a lot of mis-selling driven by conflicted remuneration and inappropriate incentives. So I think that those principles are sort of across all of those sectors. And the other thing, um, so I guess you've mentioned um, conflicts as well. Um, so there's a range of regimes around the world um, that handle conflicts a bit differently. So some jurisdictions have removed conflicts for some products, and you've seen that in the Australian experience. Um, other frameworks provide that where conflicts of interest arise, um, that they require that there are processes for avoiding or managing those conflicts, including, for example, with um, appropriate disclosures to the consumer. Um, so the existing principles already um, specify that conflict should be avoided. If they can't be avoided, they should be managed. Um, and that might include using disclosure as a tool there. Um, so one important um, revision that we're proposing to the principles in this um, instance is the addition of language around acknowledging the limits of disclosure um, in leading to good consumer outcomes. I think that's a really important um, step to enhance consumer protections and recognise um, the way that consumers act. Um, and the other important um, point as well, I think, in the revisions to the principles are around promoting the inclusion um, of good outcomes um, for consumers in principle one and also the emphasis on financial wellbeing. Um, so in keeping with the high level nature of the principles, um, I think in relation to conflicts, it's open for jurisdictions to apply them in their national laws or other um, regulatory requirements as they see fit. But I think it's certainly the positions um, getting stronger through the proposed revisions to the principles. Thank you. 
Excellent, thank you all. And we're very close to time now. So just one final question to you, Anna, just to a very short uh, answer, if you may. Uh, what are the opportunities to elevate the voice of consumer associations and representatives during the implementation uh, and ongoing monitoring of the uh, revised principles at the national level? Um, so excellent question. Um, as we've discussed today, consumer voice is extremely important. Um, I think there are some very recent instances in relation to by now pay later services where um, a united, particularly a united international consumer voice um, can have a lot of impact and drive change. And I've seen some recent media around buy now pay later products and pushing um, for the regulation of them to be considered further by governments. So I think that's an important example, um, which could also be followed in terms of the review of the principles. So the review is generating a lot of momentum, Consumers International and your members have been extremely engaged in it. Um, and once the principles are revised, there'll be a really, um, uh, I think that will provide an important platform or an opportunity um, for even more effective consumer advocacy. Um, and I would strongly encourage consumer bodies um, to advocate to their governments um, and to their providers in their jurisdictions um, in relation to enhancing the implementation of the revised principles in their jurisdiction. And the other important point is just the task force work to disseminate um, and um, issue updated implementation guidance will also be another opportunity where the consumer voice can help to add um, pressure to the debate as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anna. And the consumer voice is, of course, important to the development and evolutions of the principles. And I'm delighted that the consumer international members have played such an important role in, in the revision development phase that we've just been discussing. But importantly, I think, you know, just to reiterate that we do want to play a, a critical role going forward uh, to ensure the principles are adhered to and protect consumers of the uh, financial digital services everywhere. So thank you everyone very much for joining the session today. Um, do keep a lookout for the other sessions that we do have. They're all, uh, we've got a sustainable finance uh, tomorrow and we've recorded all of the sessions for the, the last few days. And there's some more sessions also later on today. Um, thank you all again. I hope you really enjoyed this session and I look forward to seeing you soon in some future discussions. Many thanks, bye.